So, I don't know if you've heard the news, but this year has been pretty weird. <laughs> now, while the world is slowly returning to a state of social normalcy as uh, vaccination rates rise, COVID-19 has absolutely freaking wrecked the global supply chain. There are component shortages, there are factory closures, labor issues, and more. Now, when it comes to tech rumors, Apple especially, supply chain leaks are typically really hard to control. Uh, really, generally, the, the last major surprises we get come in the form of software announcements at WWDC, where we learn about the new versions of iOS and watchOS and macOS that will be coming to the soon-to-be-released hardware that we already know all about thanks to the rumor mill. But again, this year is strange. Now, that's not to say that there's not a bevy of rumors. There are, and we will discuss them. But a lot of rumored hardware features are conflicting, release dates are really anyone's guess, and the Mac release schedule in particular is uh, <laughs> at risk. Let's start with the iPhone. After all, it's Apple's most popular product. Now, rumors from pretty much most sources indicate that this is going to be an S-tier update. No, not, not that S-tier. <laughs> Originally, rumors indicated that it would actually be called the iPhone 12S, presumably to avoid using the supposed unlucky number that's often omitted from elevators. However, recent packaging and iOS binary leaks indicate that the device will indeed be called iPhone 13. Now, call me a fanboy, but I think some of these updates sound pretty cool, even if they're evolutionary and not revolutionary. Most notably, the notch may well shrink this revision. Highly reliable leaker Ming-Chi Kuo has previously reported this, and an alleged parts leak indicates that the earpiece will be moving up to the bezel, and then Face ID components will be shrinking in size. Et voila! Smaller notch! Now, compared to the rest of the market's hole-punch cameras, the notch is still monolithic. It's huge. But it seems Apple is very committed to Face ID. Now, this may be in part due to the fact that the underscreen Touch ID sensor that had been rumored for quite a while has been nixed, at least according to reliable leaker Mark Gurman. In fact, he even postulates that Apple's eventual goal is to move Face ID under display. Of course, our primary frustration with Face ID the last year has mostly been due to a partially occluded face. With the Delta variant kind of back on the rise and people mandatorily and also electively using face masks, this is not going to be a problem going away anytime soon. But Apple may have a solution. John Prosser reports that a fairly sizable number of Apple employees have been using an iPhone 12 case with a new Face ID assembly on the top to help gather data for the new iPhone 13 Face ID sensors that would work with masks and foggy glasses. Also conveniently at the same time, because if you've ever worn a mask while wearing glasses, you know what happens. Now, how Apple is able to do this without reducing security, given that it's doing a more narrow face scan, I do not know. The renders provided by Prosser as well don't indicate a smaller notch. So really all we know is that Face ID will be modified somehow this year, and I guess, well, we'll soon find out what that means. The best upgrade this year, in my opinion, is gotta be the display. Pretty much every leaker and their dog has all but confirmed 120Hz ProMotion for the iPhones Pro. Now, I know the human eye can only see 30 FPS, but once it's a joke, by the way. <laughs> but once you have a high refresh display, it's really hard to go back. Now, why 120 hertz? I don't actually particularly know. The standard on most Android phones is 90 hertz, because while most people can absolutely distinguish the difference between 90 and 120, it is significantly less impactful than going from 60 to 90. Now, while there may be an accessibility setting, I am suspecting that in classic Apple fashion, you will not be able to set the refresh rate because they will be dynamically controlling it based on what's happening on screen. And a lot of that will be thanks to uh, the LTPO, which means low temperature polycrystalline oxide displays that we've seen utilized on Apple Watch in the past. Now, there was a rumor from the Alec last month, and they're actually pretty reputable, that all iPhone models would be getting ProMotion due to some supply chain leaks. But this does not make sense to me, because one, literally no other leaker has uh, corroborated this, and number two, ProMotion seems like a feature to distinguish the Pro models from the standard iPhone models. However, a new Mark Gurman report states that Apple will also bring an always-on display to the iPhone 13. 
One of the benefits of LTPO displays is that they can be slowed down to one hertz, which can massively save on battery life for certain tasks. Exempli gratia and always on display. I think it's very reasonable to believe that this feature will come to all iPhone models. iPhone 13 and 13 mini will have an LTPO display capable of running 1 to 60 hertz, just like the Apple Watch. And the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max will have an LTPO display capable of running 100, or excuse me, 1 to 120 hertz. So there you go, screens. <laughs> okay, let's talk cameras, starting with the Fancy Pants Pro phones. Quo, who again is very reliable, states that the iPhones Pro will be getting a new upgraded ultra wide camera with a wider 1.8 aperture, a six element lens, and autofocus. I think this would be very welcomed as the current ultra wide camera, while cool, continues to have by far the poorest image performance and also the color is like always slightly off, <laughs> which discourages many users from actually using it. Now, while unlikely, Barclay analysts suggest that the uh, old wide lens that was on the Pro phones last year may actually be making their way to all four iPhone models, but they're fairly alone in this prediction. However, the handy sensor shift technology that was introduced last year is expected to make its way to all iPhone 13 models, and the larger sensor from the 12 Pro Max may actually make its way down the line to not just the standard 13 Pro, but the other phones as well color me personally skeptical. Now there's also reports of a new astrophotography mode that would engage automatically when pointing the camera at the sky. And I think this would be super cool. I hope it makes its way onto the new phones. Better camera performance, like every year, but really nothing all that exciting. Okay, now let's talk about the last and weirdest iPhone 13 rumor that just came out last week from Ming-Chi Kuo and backed up by Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. The new Qualcomm X60 baseband modem chip would be able to connect to low Earth orbit satellites, in theory. Now, it's easy to draw the conclusion that, oh my goodness, I can finally ditch AT&T for global Starlink coverage, baby. But cool your jets, okay? Bloomberg elaborated that Apple's plans are quite a bit more mild to begin with. One potential feature would be emergency messaging, which would allow you to send a length-limited iMessage represented by a gray bubble that would work without a cellular connection. Pretty handy. A secondary feature would be the ability to contact emergency services without a signal or during instances of 911 outages, which, yes, do happen occasionally in the United States. It's a big problem. Less excited about the feature now? Oh, okay, let me ruin your dreams even further. Sasha Segan of PC Mag elaborates that this is likely just a big misunderstanding and that the iPhone's X60 modem, not X65, only supports a ground-based band to enhance LTE over greater distances. So this would not be a satellite faring phone. It's just that where LTE sucks, it could in theory be a little better. So that's kind of uh, boring if true. Speaking of boring, are you bored of the iPhone? <laughs> I sure am, does indeed sound like a 12S year. So, well, let's move on to something else. Remember how I mentioned that everything was messed up at the beginning of the year? Yeah, well, that's true. And the Apple Watch is expected to be delayed until November. So there are rumors that there will actually be a second event in early October for the Apple Watch and AirPods, perhaps alongside the iPad, but then maybe a third event in October or early November for the Mac. I don't know, man, this just seems weird to me, but uh, okay, whatever. Let's talk about the devices. Who cares about when? AirPods. Now, since their 2017 launch, the OGs have added a wireless charging case, but they've basically been unchanged since they came out. Now, an updated model is expected to bring a new form factor similar to that of AirPods Pro. So, the shorter stems, the force sensors instead of the awful tap sensors, a new wireless chip to improve battery life, but they'll have the same functionality, no ANC, and it seems that for a while those rumored silicon ear tips, uh, those have been ditched, and they're likely sticking to the same hard plastic shell that you're used to. Now, while I hate these, there are a lot of people for whom the AirPods Pro do not fit and do not work, and so I'm sure those people will be very happy that the new AirPods will accommodate them. Okay, Apple Watch. <laughs> oh boy, this one's a big one. Since its launch in 2015, the Apple Watch design has remained, well, the same. Sure, the screen has gotten a little larger with rounded corners and new sensors have been added, but a new Apple Watch doesn't look discernibly different from an original Apple Watch, and here's proof. 
That's about to change with the Series 7. A new square design is pretty much all but confirmed to be coming to this year's models to match the new design language found across Apple's lineup. Now, it is my personal opinion that this is actually not a great look. Now, I've seen a lot of people say, well, regular watches have flat sides, and that's actually generally true, but they're typically rounded watches. You need dimensionality. And well, the majority of square watches, and yes, they exist, actually have tapered or beveled size to eliminate an extruded monolithic look that I fear the Apple Watch Series 7 will take on. With that said, Mark Newson, the guy that designed the Apple Watch with Joni Ive, had previously designed this. So <laughs> maybe a squared watch with squared edges isn't that far-fetched. Hopefully it doesn't make the already chubby watch look even higher off of your arm. Now look, I admit I am a watch snob, most people don't care, and really nobody buys an Apple Watch because they're objectively beautiful. After all, they're pretty much a, a computer watch. <laughs> there are going to be two new sizes, 41 millimeters and 45 millimeters, up from 40 and 44. Now, a lot of people stripped gears last week saying, ah, this is just Apple trying to get you to buy new bands. No, it isn't. Now look, traditional watches are measured by their dial size, not the size of the case. And Apple, well, they've followed suit. You'll remember the original Apple watches were 38 and 42 millimeters. Now on the Series 4, when they made the screen bigger, they moved to 40 and 44 millimeters, but the cases remained largely the same and the bands still worked. The same will happen again. The new display obviously will have thinner bezels and is actually rumored to have a new lamination technique that is supposed to reduce reflections, which is kind of handy. It's also rumored to be getting a new UWB chip for Find My as well. Now, a blood pressure sensor was originally rumored for this year and has been found on other devices like the new Samsung Galaxy Watch, but Mark Gurman says there is no chance that it makes it to this generation of Apple Watch. So it seems that this year, well, the, the design is the upgrade and new sensors will come next year. And obviously, I really don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, most people are not upgrading their Apple Watch every year. Actually, the average update cycle is about three years. So people that are on the Series 4 now, the Series 7 will be a really, really nice jump. They'll get a bunch of new sensors they don't have, and everyone's happy. Okay, let's talk iPad. The iPad is really weird this year because there have been so few iPad rumors that it kind of blows my mind. Nobody really seems to know what's going on or what's going to happen. Interestingly, the iPad that is rumored to be getting an upgrade is the one that you have most certainly forgotten about, iPad Mini. Now, John Prosser showed previews of this updated iPad mini back in June, uh, with it adopting the style of iPad Air. So Touch ID in the power button and rocking USB-C, but with a much smaller 8.3 inch footprint. Now, more recently, other leakers have been backing him up. It seems that the device won't be getting a mini LED treatment. That said, I don't know why this is surprising. The iPad Air doesn't have it. And price-wise, it will probably continue to sit at, well, its current price in between the basic iPad and the more expensive iPad Air. I'm actually really excited for this. I love my 12.9 inch iPad Pro, but it's absolutely massive. And having a little around home, around town, around office iPad for reading RSS, news, watching YouTube and more would be amazing. As for other iPads, well, it's pretty much anyone's guess. Now we get to the only part that I actually care about, the M1 Mac, baby. Now it has been over a year since the M1 Macs were announced and almost a year since they've been publicly released. And they've been awesome. I use a MacBook Air at home and I use an iMac here at the office. And in fact, they've been so awesome and so fast that I gotta admit, they've taken me away from my iPad Pro, which pre-Apple Silicon, I was all about. It was like my primary machine. They're friggin' sweet, but with that said, they're not really compute powerhouses. Sure, they're impressive for their power envelope and their single core performance is insane, but their graphics compute and multi-core performance, uh, it hasn't even remotely put Apple's Intel-based Macs on death row yet. That finally may be changing this fall. Now, given the popularity of Apple's notebook series and the rising difficulty of handling parts logistics, it's likely that the only computers we'll see from Apple with what remains of 2021 are the new MacBook Pros, which again, are Apple's best-selling computers. 
there were rumors of a Mac Mini with a more powerful SoC, revised design, MagSafe, etc. But prioritizing a new design revision of Mac Mini, literally their worst selling computer, it just makes no sense to me. Anyways, uh, most rumors have concluded pushing it to sometime next year or 2023 anyways. So see you later, Mac Mini. So let's talk MacBook Pro. It's obviously going to ship with the new M1X processor that I talked about in this video using the Jade C die. It will be offered with a 10 core CPU, eight of those cores will be high performance cores, and then an option of a 32 core GPU on the high end or a chop variant with 16 graphics cores on the base configuration. Now on the memory front, WCCF Tech and others have reported that the machine will max out at 32 gigs of memory instead of the originally rumored 64 gigs. I really hope that this is not the case. Now, while most people don't need more than 32 gigs on Apple Silicon because of the way that Mac OS handles memory management, there are absolutely, make no mistake, there are absolutely people that need 64 gigs of memory or more. And if it's an SOC issue, that's even more problematic for upcoming uh, machines using this M1X revision, like the rumored iMac Pro for next year. Unlike the original Apple Silicon MacBooks, these will have more than mere internal upgrades. There is consensus that there will be a new design with squared edges, pretty similar to the rest of Apple's lineup, and also <laughs> Microsoft's. MagSafe will also be rumored to be returning, and German says that it will be different from uh, MagSafe ports of the past, but similarly pill-shaped. This is an interesting move because you know, USB-C PD is amazing, and I have to suspect that you'll still be able to charge the laptops with USB-C PD, but MagSafe is great. I think MagSafe has been missed, and with MagSafe returning on the iPhone it only and the iMac, it only makes sense that they'll kind of bring it to well, their laptops. The device is probably in the most peril of being pulled off of the desk. They're also expected to be rocking the new mini LED screens, in theory. Now, there have been quite a few reports for quite a while now that production delays and yield rate on these new mini LEDs is quite low. So get ready for them to be sold out for quite some time. Now, with a little extra internal room, remember the new PCB on this chip is going to be diminutive. There are rumors that Apple will be maybe somewhat admitting fault. <laughs> Just kidding, they won't do that. But maybe adding back some of the old ports that they have taken away. Most notably, an HDMI port, which would be freaking fantastic because that is by far the most frequently needed port that I just don't have. And carrying dongles sucks. And then also they're rumored to be adding a UHS-2 SD card slot for cameras, which is nice. Though I will admit it seems kind of weird because most new higher end cameras are no longer using SD cards, at least not primarily. So a nice addition, but not strictly needed. Now, despite a smaller rumored chassis, the battery size won't decrease, which is good. And uh, well, presumably the M1X will be significantly more efficient than the outgoing Intel chips. So battery life will even be better despite the actual cells not really getting any larger. Uh, 99.534 watt hours, so 100 watt hours for the 16 inch, which is the largest battery you can legally fly with on a carry-on in the United States. And then uh, the smaller 14 inch MacBook Pro will be getting a 69, nice, 0.599 watt hour battery, which is just a couple watt hours more than the current system has. No, and then I almost forgot the best rumor of them all. Apple is expected to be finally killing the touch bar, yeah, and replacing it with physical function keys. I'm a little bummed I won't be able to DJ on it anymore, but otherwise, thank goodness. <laughs> there are a lot more rumors, but none of them are slated for this year. And I think this video has gone on long enough, don't you? So get subscribed if you haven't already to make sure that you don't miss our upcoming coverage of, uh, well, these events, and then also our videos about the actual product releases. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, send it to someone you don't like. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay snappy.